the Suez Canal, never far from the news in its 87 years of history, hits the headlines like a bombshell, when, without a hint of warning, Egypt's premier, Colonel Nasser, announces that his country is taking it over. The profit is to be used to complete the Aswan Dam, the huge project from which Britain and America recently withdrew their offers of financial aid. Two years ago, Britain agreed to withdraw her troops. The canal would become Egypt's property in 1968. Mr. Anthony Head signed for Britain, NASA for Egypt. Now, NASA tears the agreement up. The canal, he says, is nationalized forthwith. Shareholders will be paid current stock exchange prices. The 36 million pounds annual profit will become Egyptian revenue. Britain kept her side of the pact. She withdrew the troops which had guarded for so long this most vital of the world's waterways. No sooner had the last British soldier gone than NASA triumphantly hoisted the Egyptian flag over the canal's own base. Now he has seized the canal itself and Britain suffers most. For she is not only the main shareholder, but also the main user. Egyptian crowds enthusiastically acclaim NASA, but Egypt's arbitrary action has provoked a major crisis. After weeks of stalemate, the Suez crisis bursts dramatically into the news again, for Israel has invaded Egypt. Britain and France have declared the canal in danger, and British and French troops are on the move. General Moshe Dayan, one-eyed commander-in-chief, orders the tanks into action. Israeli forces sweep across the frontier into the Egyptian desert, while Premier Ben-Gurion declares general mobilization. Within hours, the leading Israeli columns are driving towards the canal. Britain and France react at once with an ultimatum. Stop the fighting or we march in. Israel accepts if Egypt will, but Egypt flatly refuses. The world waits tensely to see whether the British flag will fly once more over Suez. Obviously shy of visitors, so the Duke decides he would like to go ashore and introduce himself to the local population as soon as a suitable landing place can be found. They're still not too anxious to make friends. When they can't avoid a social meeting, they put on their party manners, but not for too long. Huskies, of course, are blase about humans, probably because they know humans couldn't get very far without them in these parts. But whatever the occasion, the penguins are always hospitable and perfectly dressed. Dinner jackets, of course. After all, you never know whom you're likely to meet in the Antarctic. A shadow falls on the last stages of the Duke of Edinburgh's tour. Lieutenant Commander Michael Parker, his Finland secretary, has resigned. Gough Island in the South Atlantic, with its lonely weather station, is one of the last Commonwealth outposts on the homeward journey of the Royal Yacht Britannia. The island is just far enough south to have its quota penguins. Commander Parker gets to know one of them personally. This particular breed of penguin prefers the rocks of a running stream to the ice flows of the Antarctic. Hence their local name, rock hoppers. But the Duke proves himself just as expert in getting around. During their tour of the Antarctic, the Duke and his party have nearly all grown beards, and the local population are clearly impressed. Viscount airliner waits on the tarmac of London Airport to take the Queen to Portugal for her state visit. The Prime Minister and the Airport Commandant, Mr. Jeffs, escort her to the aircraft. A 
farewell handshake for BEA Chairman Lord Douglas and the Airport Commandant. For Her Majesty, this is not only a state occasion. The Duke of Edinburgh is waiting at Montijo Airport near Lisbon to meet her after four months apart. The Duke's Commonwealth tour has been the longest separation of their married life, and the Royal Standard can seldom have marked the beginning of a happier flight. Godspeed to the Queen on her double mission of private reunion and international goodwill. is ablaze with flags for the visit of Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh, a visit which is a royal reunion as well as a state event. The Portuguese are quick to capture the almost honeymoon spirit of the occasion. Matching the beauty of the city, the Royal Yacht Britannia glides up the smooth waters of the River Tagus into the heart of Lisbon. Waiting on the quayside are President Cradiero Lopes and his wife. A royal salute thunders from the training bark Sagres as the state barge approaches the quay, manned by sailors in historic ceremonial dress. A most appropriate way for the queen of a seafaring nation to arrive in the capital of a people whose sailors have a tradition as ancient as our own. Lisbon is not disappointed. It expected a happy queen, and she is smiling from the moment of her welcome. The Duke, too, is obviously in the best of spirits and looking very fit after his long tour of the Southern Hemisphere. Mr. Harold Macmillan becomes Prime Minister of Great Britain after Sir Anthony Eden's surprise resignation. A surprise even to his cabinet colleagues. The Foreign Minister Selwyn Lloyd leaves Downing Street after a dramatic ten-minute meeting. Behind him is Housing Minister Duncan Sands. They have just learned from Sir Anthony of the doctor's verdict which has left him no alternative but to go to Buckingham Palace and lay his resignation before the Queen. By now, the Downing Street crowds realize that something momentous is afoot. On his way to number 11, Chancellor Macmillan and his wife and daughter are surrounded by photographers, for already he is named as a possible successor. Next morning, the comings and goings at the palace are watched with mounting excitement. Who is being called for advice and who to be offered leadership? Sir Winston Churchill arrives. Is his counsel being sought or perhaps even his return for a few months? Most people expect the mantle to fall on Mr. R.A. Butler, Lord Privy Seal and leader of the Commons. Everyone has his own opinion and some their private or public prayers. The final choice of Mr. Harold Macmillan, who arrives perhaps symbolically riding in the front seat, comes as a surprise to many, till they think over his record. As housing minister, when in less than two years he carried out the government's election pledge of building 300,000 houses. His brief but effective term at the defense ministry. As foreign secretary, particularly his big three talks with America's Foster Dulles and France's Antoine Pinay. Finally, as chancellor and author of the premium bond scheme. Edward Poinder Grigg, second Baron Altrincham, is in hot water. This 33-year-old peer often expresses views unpopular with his fellow Tories. But now he is under fire from inside and outside his own party. In an article in his journal, The National and English Review, he voices criticisms of the Queen and her court, which rouse the wrath of much of the national press. Bow Street Magistrates Court London is the scene of a sequel to the flare-up caused by the article. Mr. Philip Burbage leaves after being fined a pound for slapping Lord Altrincham's face in public. The magistrate is Sir Lawrence Dunn, who tells him, you have only made a most unsavoury episode more squalid. Later, Pathé News asked Mr. Burbage if he thinks the fine was worth it. Well worth it. I think the best investment ever I made. And in fact, that pound was returned to me by an unknown within seconds. Meanwhile, holidaying at Balmoral are those who cannot reply to the criticisms, the Queen and her family. Some consider Lord Altrincham's article was more restrained than certain press reports implied. It suggested that the courtiers who surround royalty advise the Queen badly and are too narrow in their outlook. It also declared that Prince Charles's education should bring him into contact with all sections of the community. Pathé News decided to discuss the controversy with Lord Altrincham himself. So, why did you write this article about the Queen? Well, uh, I'm a, uh, a journalist, I'm a subject of the Queen, I care very much 
uh, her future and I want her reign to be as successful as it possibly can be. Are you at all repentant in view of criticisms? No, I can't say I am. I mean, uh, anything controversial provokes criticism. But uh, I'm quite sure this needed saying. And from the letters that I'm getting in enormous numbers, I'm convinced that a majority of the people in this country, and I think also in other countries of the Commonwealth, are on my side in, in this matter. My letters at the moment are running three to one in my favour. But even if they weren't, I should still not be repentant, because I'm sure that what I said was true and needed saying. You've been very critical about the court and the Queen's speeches. Have you anything to say about this? Yeah, well, very briefly, I think the trouble about the court is that it's all drawn from one small section of this country. It should be drawn from every country of the Commonwealth and from every section of the community. That's what I feel about the court. About the Queen's speeches, I feel that uh, her own natural self is not allowed to come through. Uh, it's a sort of synthetic creature that speaks, uh, not the Queen as she really is. And if she herself were allowed to speak, the, the, the effect would be wonderful. American Billy Graham faces a battery of press cameras as, with his young wife Ruth, he comes to Britain on board the luxury liner SS United States. Hailed as the most potent evangelist in American history, Graham, a 35-year-old ex-baseball player, spoke to crowds numbering two million last year in the States, as well as writing a daily newspaper column and broadcasting regularly to Europe and America. Graham, who admits he is overawed by the prospect of his three-month crusade in Britain, right. answers questions put by a Pathé News reporter. Uh, Mr. Graham, what is the purpose of coming to Britain? Well, the purpose of coming to Britain uh, is that uh, we were invited by approximately a thousand churches of the city of London to come and conduct an evangelistic mission. And we're going to conduct this mission very much as we would in the United States. And one final question, do you think you can do anything about the Russians? <laughs> That's not in my area at all. I'm not in politics. I, I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I haven't come to Britain with any idea of saving Britain or changing Britain. I've come here simply to present the message of Christ. And I'd like to make this statement, I think it's relevant to the point, that I've not come to talk about politics or to uh, make any statements that might be construed as political, either conservative or socialist. Thank you, Mr. Graham. You thank you, sir. At a tobacco millionaire's house near Antwerp, group captain Peter Townsend, 44, posed with a girl he's going to marry. marie Luce Yamen, the millionaire's daughter, is 20. She accompanied Townsend as a photographer on his two-year trip around the world. He was headline news in all countries when it was on the cards that he would marry Princess Margaret. The engagement is approved of by the girl's parents. No affairs of state stand in the way this time, as they did before Princess Margaret made her official statement that she and the group captain would not be getting married. Now, Peter and Marie Luce walked about the quaysides of Antwerp, very popular figures, filmed and photographed wherever they went. A 
like the princess, Marie Luce was very young when she first met Peter Townsend. He, it'll be remembered, was on the staff of the late king as an equity. The marriage may take place before many weeks have passed. The happy pair will have the good wishes of all. By train from Sandringham at the end of her Christmas holiday, the Queen returned to London. Prince Charles travelled with her, though for him it was only a very brief stay. He went back to Cheam School later in the same day. The Queen looked well and appeared to be in good spirits. So the royal standard flies over the palace once more. It's 11 years now since Prince Charles was a baby, a delight to his mother and already promising to be a very bright child. In August 1950, Princess Anne came on the scene and when she was christened, the royal family posed for these pictures. At the palace, early next month, if not the end of this, the Queen's third child will be born. They waited every day, hoping to be the first of Her Majesty's subjects to hear the joyous news. Even before the Duke of Edinburgh came back from Sandringham, the people waited. Sister Helen Rowe, radiating calmness and confidence as midwife to the Queen, was summoned to the palace. So was Mr. John Peel, the Queen's obstetrician. And at last came the announcement, awaited by the whole Commonwealth and indeed almost the whole world, in salute, the guns roared out. Royal Lodge Windsor was the most appropriate setting of a royal romance. How dramatically had the welcome news been announced to the world? Princess Margaret was engaged to Mr. Anthony Armstrong Jones. And suddenly it was spring. Nature herself seemed to be glad. In warmth and sunshine bathed the grounds of Royal Lodge. To the princess and many of the royal family, Mr. Armstrong Jones has been known for some time. His talent as a photographer earned him the privilege of taking informal pictures of the Queen, the Duke and the royal children, pictures published in newspapers and magazines all over the world. Her Majesty invited him to Sandringham in January, and it was then, say reports, that the Princess and he decided to marry. The ruby and diamond ring is this year's most photographed piece of jewellery. To see it on the Princess's finger gives pleasure to all the millions who wish to see her happy. Above all, to the Queen Mother. She, like the Queen herself, has warmly approved the engagement. In what has been called the best kept secret of modern times, the engagement was not announced earlier owing to the imminence of the Queen's baby. Now everyone in Britain and the Commonwealth wholeheartedly wishes long years of happiness to the Princess and her fiancé. Upon Westminster Abbey centred the thoughts of all Britain and millions beyond the seas. A princess of unique personality, gay, intelligent, compellingly human, was marrying the man of her own choice. The moment for which thousands outside the abbey had waited several hours had now arrived. To the west door came the glass coach bearing Her Royal Highness the Bride. People near had their first glimpse of the wedding gown. It was perhaps surprising in its simplicity. Of white silk organza, its classical design is expected to be very much the fashion among brides this year. This was a tense moment for the Queen, Queen Mother and Bridegroom. All who were privileged to be in the Abbey remarked the quite astonishing beauty of the Princess radiant in her happiness as never before. The 
Archbishop of Canterbury waited to receive the bride and groom as they approached the fall stools. Margaret Rose, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? I will. <coughs> they were now married and made their way to the chapel to sign the registers. The bride and bridegroom now reappeared before the vast congregation. The 50 minutes magical solemnity of the marriage service was over. By the west door, the princess and her husband emerged into the outer world, which they would now walk together, joined in holy matrimony. To the little bridesmaids, there was an affectionate wave. Then the waiting thousands really let themselves go. At last they saw Princess Margaret as a wife. For the entire royal family, this was a day of joy they will never forget. Outside, fully 150,000 people, with unbounded enthusiasm, acclaimed Princess Margaret and her husband when they appeared on the balcony. It's a long time since anyone landed in London for a welcome, both official and unofficial, as big as this. According to protocol, the arrival of President Kennedy and his wife from Vienna follows the set pattern. Premier Macmillan there to greet them, the machinery of news, the long walk from the aircraft among the gold braid. But although the drill is as stereotyped as a minuet, there's more to it than that. For one of the two most powerful men in the world has just come from meeting the other one. And to everyone's delight, including Lady Dorothy McMillan's, he has brought his wife, Jackie. So much for the official welcome. Everything has gone according to plan. The Guard of Honor and the airport staff can relax. But something not even the cabinet could have planned is the half million people lining the route from London Airport to the West End just to cheer a hello to Jack and Jackie. And it's like that for the whole of their two brief visit. The Kennedys stay at the home of Jackie's sister, Princess Ratchaville in Pimlico, and the Macmillans go in with them for 20 minutes. But not immediately, for a sizable slice of those half million people want to have a look at them. In particular, of course, to have a look at Jackie. But there is work to be done, and next morning the two leaders have a three-hour talk at Admiralty House. Normally, it would be at number 10, but that, of course, is being rebuilt. The Kennedys managed to pack a tremendous amount into their 24-hour stay.
State House at Accra was the scene of the farewell ball, and there was just about room for the hundreds crowding the floor. The dance, High Life, popular in the country for more than 40 years. It's described as a rhythmic shuffle, but it takes a lot of practice to do it well. It was danced to Welcome Your Majesty, specially composed for the occasion. The Queen danced with President Nkrumah and thoroughly enjoyed it all. At last it was farewell. Britannia awaited the Queen and the Duke at Takoradi. Her Majesty said that the exciting 12-day tour had gone by like a flash. Finally, goodbye and thanks to President and Mrs. Nkrumah for their wonderful hospitality. The Queen will all her life cherish memories of the kindness and affection showered upon her throughout the Republic of Ghana. That smiling face with which the whole world was familiar, death has blotted out. He stood at the pinnacle of the political world. He had a most attractive wife and two young children. In every possible way, he was completely fitted to occupy the White House. The last pictures we showed of him were taken there when he was host to the Black Watch. An off-duty picture of John F. Kennedy, happy father of those two entrancing children. And all that happiness, so soon to be shattered. Jackie went with him on his last political journey. In Dallas, he was welcomed to Texas by State Governor Connolly. There, too, was the Vice President, Mr. Lyndon Johnson, who is a Texan. In that state, the Democratic government is not popular, but the Kennedy charm seemed to be effective as ever as the motorcade was cheered on its way. From a high window rings out the shot that changes American history. Confusion is indescribable. Both the President and Governor Connolly are hit. While they are rushed to hospital, swarms of police and FBI men search for the assassin. At the hospital, there is a desperate but hopeless fight to save the President's life. But that life ebbs out. The doctors afterwards say there never was a chance. The flowers Mrs. Kennedy carried lie bloodstained in the car. Thousands in Dallas are weeping at the tragedy. The police now have the murder gun. On it, they say, a palm print of the man under arrest. He is 24-year-old Lee Harvey Oswald. Four years ago, he defected to Russia, worked there, and married a Russian. Now the world hears the appalling news. President Kennedy is dead. In a bronze coffin, his body arrives at the airport. Mrs. Kennedy, her dress stained with her husband's blood, rides in the ambulance. Automatically, Mr. Lyndon Johnson becomes president. Gordonstown is the royal choice, the school in northeastern Scotland to which the Duke of Edinburgh went himself. This is where Prince Charles will be in the next summer term and be treated the same as all the other 400 boys. Indoors and out, Gordonstown stresses initiative, character, self-reliance and of course fitness. Those who discover that they have special talent get the chance to develop it. When Prince Philip was there, he took part in amateur dramatics, apparently amused about it, and captained the Cricket Eleven. Eton was expected by most people outside the royal circle to be the school of the future king. This is preeminently the choice of the establishment, the key into the cabinet, perhaps the foremost school in the world. But probably, had the Prince of Wales gone there, it would have widened the gap between the royal family and the people. To Cheam, the Eton of prep schools, Prince Charles went in November 1957. As the Duke was there too as a small boy, the son is following the educational pattern of the father. His arrival made it a memorable day for the Prince and the school, though the boys took it in their stride. That day was just over four years ago. Prince Charles is said to have enjoyed every minute of his time there and has grown into early adolescence as fine a boy as his parents could have wished. He is now 13 and no doubt looking forward to moving to a senior school. The big day began at London Airport, where the Duke of Edinburgh took Prince Charles to fly him to school. The Duke used the Heron aircraft in which he has made many flights. 
Prince Charles showed no sign of nerves, whatever he may have been feeling. This is the really modern way to go to school, by aeroplane, piloted by father. At Gordonston, the Prince of Wales will spend the next five years, a complete break with royal tradition. On arrival, the Duke and his son were received by the chairman of the governors, the kilted Captain Ian Tennant. Next, the headmaster, Mr. Robert Chew, with whom was the warden, Mr. Henry Breton. Thirty years ago, Prince Philip was a boy at Gordonston, the main reason why the Queen and he are sending Prince Charles here. The headmaster pointed out Prince Philip's old room. A 17th century mansion houses the main part of the school, but Windmill Lodge will be Prince Charles's house. To Mr. Robert Whitby, the housemaster, the head boy and the head of the house, the new boy was introduced. The Duke knew he was leaving his son in capable hands. Peter Pace, the head boy, is 18. Prince Charles will wear the jersey and short uniform for the rest of his stay at Gordonston. Dougald Mackenzie, head of Windmill House, is a joiner's son. So the Prince will be living in a much more democratic atmosphere than if he'd gone to Eton or Harrow. Gordonston puts the emphasis on fitness and self-reliance no less than schoolwork. If it makes Prince Charles as good a man as his father, it will have served him and the country well. Have you ever wanted to be a famous opera singer or an archaeologist? To most of us in more ordinary careers, these are just idle dreams. But let's introduce a London osteopath who, after reaching the top of his profession, decided he'd like to conquer another field. And, as you'll discover, he looks like succeeding. The second subject is art, and these talented hands belong to Dr. Stephen Ward. His subject on this occasion is, well, see for yourself. You were right, of course. Surprisingly solemn, but unmistakably, Terry Thomas. The average artist often needs several sittings, but Dr. Ward often finishes a portrait like this in about 10 minutes. Mr. Macmillan, he did without the benefit of a sitting. The week of Tory turmoil was over, but what a week it had been. The nation began to get tired of having to speculate on which minister from the shortlist would be Premier. Lord Hailsham's chance, up one minute, down the next. What really was going on in cabinet circles? Could Mr. Butler be left out again? Lord Hume and Mr. Maudlin, both were strong possibilities. At last, from the King Edward VII Hospital for Officers, the Prime Minister sent his resignation to the Queen. Pleased by this development on medical grounds was his personal doctor, Sir John Richardson. The famous patient had been working far too hard. Very graciously, the Queen came to the hospital to consult with Mr. Macmillan on the appointment of his successor. It wasn't long before the news was out. The choice was Lord Hume. The nurses were more interested in getting a view as Her Majesty left to return to the palace. From the palace, the Queen sent for Lord Hume to invite him to form a government. Lord Hume accepted Her Majesty's invitation. He was now on his way to number 10 as Prime Minister, an office few people until recently ever thought would be his. In the Tory party, no choice would have been unanimously approved. But perhaps when the tumult subsides, Lord Hume will be a popular Premier. He addressed himself now to the task of choosing his cabinet. The excitement in Buckingham Palace was reflected by the whole nation. The people outside were among the first to learn the good news. Signed by five doctors, the bulletin announced that the Queen was safely delivered of a son at 8.20 that evening. Her Majesty and the infant prince were both well. The Duke had telephoned the wonderful news to the Queen Mother, Princess Margaret, and to his two children at school, Prince Charles and Princess Anne. So, the hitherto youngest of this very happy family, Prince Andrew, now has a baby brother. The three children here were a bit younger when these pictures were taken. And it's good that Prince Andrew, now four years old, will have a brother near to his own age. With four children, the Queen is leading the trend back to larger families. The
people of the mother country and the Commonwealth share the joy of the royal family and most warmly congratulate the Queen and Duke.